Okay, we are going to begin in prayer together. And uh, well, welcome to the 51st, uh, no, I mean, 30th, 30th year, 30th year. <laughs> 51st year in Bethany. I'm still thinking of back home. But the 30th year of ministry, we commence. And as we commence on the subject two, one on prayer, later on on the Word of God, um, we call these our twin pillars in Bethany. <coughs> and, uh, you know, these have been the way in which it took bouncy right now. Um, you know, have been the ways in which we have seen um, how the Lord has continued to lead and to bless. And I, I very much would like to encourage us all to think about this two aspects. This morning on prayer, later on in the morning worship or the Word of God. And try to see how we can apply these same principles into Bethel's ministry. <coughs> think about it. Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the challenge to begin a whole new year on the basis of seeking you and to pray. We pray that you will help us to focus very much on learning how to pray prayers that are truly significant. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, we are going to take a look at <coughs> Philippians 1 as the focus this morning. Right? So right, this morning I want to distinguish between what I call general prayers. But most of us pray very general prayers. When I say general prayers, I mean, let's say, if a person is sick, natural, we pray the Lord's grace and mercy to get well. Right? For students who are going for exams in a natural, we pray for uh, grace and for success in uh, studies, for exams, and to do well. Right? And then we, we sort of, this is basically the focus on many people's prayer. I call this a very general prayers. They are very common things. We, it's like praying for our daily bread. It's like praying for guidance along the way. I mean, we have people requesting prayers like that all the time as fast as we receive, you know, um, this is a situation uh, these are challenging times. So we pray about things like that. Are they wrong? No, they are not. Right? But in reality, these are what we call ordinary prayers. And that's it. Right? But what is <coughs> really a, <coughs> a significant prayer anyway? So how do we understand this idea of a significant prayer in let, let me say this. This is one of those prayers of, of Paul that would be considered significant. I like to study the, the prayers of Paul because for every church group, every church community, his prayers are very different. Right? Ephesians 2 prayers, chapter 1, chapter 3. Philippians 1, one prayer. And all the prayers that Paul makes are not general prayers. They're very specific, right? Specific to the particular church, right? In Ephesians 1, the church needed a lot of knowledge, understanding, wisdom. That's what he prayed for, right? So then in Philippians, his prayer was different again. So it's not a standard prayer. See, like we all pray, I mean, as parents, we pray for our children. They may grow up well, they may be saved, or God bless their lives, that's it. Those are general prayers, and you know what? They are, they are answered. But what we have are very general thoughts and ideas. That's it. So what is a significant prayer? So for that matter, we ask ourselves, what would be a significant prayer for Bethel as we begin the 30th year of ministry? 
What would be that prayer? Now, watch this very carefully. In Matthew chapter 9, we have a story of two blind men who came to the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus asked them, <clears throat> what do you wish? He says, and they said, um, you know, we want to be, to, we want to have sight. We want to no longer be blind. We want to be made well. And the Lord Jesus made a very important statement there in Matthew 9.29. that he said, according to your faith, so let it be to you. That's a very, very interesting phrase. According to your faith, let it be to you. Well, that's what we need to ask ourselves. You see, a lot of times we pray general prayers, and very frankly, it doesn't even require much faith. We just pray, give us this day our daily bread, that's it. And we forget about it. Uh, please help me with my exams, and we forget about it. Uh, please help me, look, give me a good job, and we forget about it, that's it. But when we pray such prayers, if they are with reference to the church, the church will never go beyond any level. Now, I say this to you because I come from a background of uh, you know, having to lead Bethany for 50 years. If we make general prayers, Beth Bethany will just be a very general church. The challenge is to learn how to offer significant, relevant prayers. And if we don't know how to make those prayers, we lack the faith to make those prayers. You know what? We'll just go into another year, the 30th year, and we will, at the end of next year, in, in, in September, we will celebrate the 30th anniversary, and another year has gone by. My challenge is that we learn how to offer significant prayers. And this must be according to the faith that we have. And if we don't have that faith, we cannot make significant prayers. It would just be another ordinary prayer. And I would very, very much, and Pastor Chris and I have been talking and we have been asking and speaking to each other. And I said to him, you know, I think this is the time when we must dare to make a significant prayer. Right? So these are the elements of the significant prayer that we are going to take a look at. This is very important. Right? What are these prayers like? And of course, part of it is what we call depth. Meaning, relevance, right? Now, this is how we want to offer this prayer, all right? So let's look at the practical way in which a prayers are to be made, right? Now, this is very important for us. You see, sometimes when we pray, if we pray, and so we will say we pray for Bethel. See, it's just like, okay, the celebration was on Friday, uh, all the young people, thank God for them. They work very hard, and uh, it's, they went home midnight, and we thank God for the young people. And then we breathe a sigh of relief. We say thank you. And you know what? It's another memory. How, how significant is that kind of response? Frankly, it isn't. But if you were to say, well, battle begins on the 30th year today, how would we pray? Right? So this is how we pray. So let's pray, first and foremost, general with thanksgiving. Lord, thank God for... So I, I thank God for Pastor Chris, for Eldin, and all who are there. Right? So thank God for all the younger people and they are there 
that they will be, they can be counted on if you ask them to do this. They will do it. Thank God for them. But watch, it's still a general prayer. Right? So we thank God for them and we, we are just happy and it's Thanksgiving, it's made with joy, no problem. So now we go on a little bit deeper. The, the deeper now is when we pray for Bethel, what is really in our heart? Now it's important, right? Because this is where Paul uh, tells the Philippians that they were in his heart. Very frankly, if we do not have someone in our heart, prayers will always be general. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's very obvious. When we pray for our children and other people's children, are they the same? Frankly, no. Why? Because they are our children. We can pray general prayers for people, right? I mean, this is important for us to uh, take note of. But if we don't know them, if they're not in our hearts, you'll find that we can't even think about praying significantly. So you have to ask yourself honestly, what does Bethel really mean to you? If it is just, oh, you know, okay, uh, I'm there, I'm part of the church, thank God for the church, that's a very general prayer. You have to ask yourself, what does Bethel really mean? So I asked myself, what does Bethel mean? So Pastor Christian, he, was, he and I were talking about, you know, planning for the 29th anniversary. So he's been here 16 years. I've been there long, twice more years than he has been. Because I was with this battle ministry for 29 years and before. Right? Now, this is very important. So, I've been traveling to Perth in the past, every other month, for 30 years. That's a long time. That's proof of what it is. If you really want to say, battle is in the heart. Don't just say, prove it. So, I was here. Right from the beginning. And before. And you're there all the time. Then you can say, Bethel is in my heart. Mm. You see, this is what praying significant prayers, this is where it begins. If it is not really in your heart, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, it's a general prayer. So you have to ask yourself, is Bethel really in your heart? And I'll tell you this, it's not easy to have something really in the heart. Right? So I was very happy, of course, when they showed uh, my little sugar that brought a special uh, lift to the heart. It was, I miss him, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing him late tonight, you know. And, uh, you know, I, that's that special place in the heart. This is what we must ask ourselves. Is Bethel really special to our heart? Paul tells them that he, affection of the Lord is in his heart for the church. Of all the churches that Paul founded, the closest was the Philippian church. Did he love the Ephesian church? Yes. But the danger was it's going astray. That was a reality. The Corinthian church, he had to really sit on them because they were really, really going wayward. Right? So every church is different. The Philippian church, he can say honestly, this church was in his heart. You can never make a significant prayer until when God examines your heart, do you really have battle in your heart? And if the answer is no, 
you cannot make this prayer because it doesn't work. Remember, God does not hear words alone. He looks into the heart. So, question, how many people really has battle in the heart? Right? Very often we come to church because we benefit from it. The greater challenge is how do you benefit battle? Not the other way around. Can we ask ourselves how you are actually caring for battle? Right, so the young people say, okay, uh, I, am, I, I love the church, you know, I feel for it, I serve the Lord here. Well and good. But that does not necessarily mean that you really, really love the church. It's much more than that. So this is important for us to understand, right? So we read the basis of Paul's prayer, no question about it. 1.7. Let's take a look at what he says in 1.7. It's very, very clear. Paul says, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all. Why? Because I have you in my heart. But seriously, let's ask ourselves, is Bethel really in your heart? I think this is something that we must ask ourselves. Is it really in your heart? Now, you have to answer this before the Lord because I tell you this, it's very hard to say this is in your heart. Honestly. We are part of it, but not necessarily in the heart. And this is very important for us to understand. Okay. How does Paul prove it? He says, in as much as both in my chains. Well, let's take a look. How did Paul actually begin his ministry in Philippi, at the riverside. And then, in chains, he went to jail before he started the ministry in, in Philippi. That was his work. So he can say, in my chains, I suffered for the church. Now, you ask yourself, how much have you actually suffered for the church. Actually, people don't. Right? Now, Paul was able to say, listen, my chains. Then he talked about how he made his defense and confirmation and then partakers of grace with the church. In other words, if you say battle is in your heart, prove it. Seriously. Let me say this to you. Right? Bethel is in your heart, really? Every day you pray for it. Most people don't. It's once in a while. Two, set aside funds. Every month, give. And I mean it, give. And people don't. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll give whatever is in my wallet. That's not the kind of giving that speaks of battle in the heart. Right? So you plan giving. Right? If India is in my heart, I plan to give. If Myanmar is in my heart, I plan to give. If Bethany is in my heart, I plan to give. If Bethel is in my heart, I plan to give. Are you serious? Then you're giving all over the place. Yes. That is proof of what is in the heart. You see, a lot of us have just words to offer. Nothing else. So, before we even make this significant prayer, we must ask ourselves, check, is battle really in our hearts? Is Bethel really in our affection? One of gift is nothing. Ask yourself, the whole year through, 29th anniversary, 29 years, the 29th year, one whole year, what have you actually given? A whole year, think, a whole year, how much given? Anyone? 
And you realize to your horror, Bethel is not in the heart after all. Don't, don't measure it by words. Don't measure it by feelings. Measure it, Paul says, my chains, my defense, my confirmation, grace. Prove it. Right? Now, this is important. It's something that we need to think about very, very carefully. Can we? And, and Paul says, God is my witness. How greatly I long for you all with the affection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is all preliminary. Now, you ask yourself, okay, can you dare to say, God is my witness, I really love Bethel. Really? Say that. And we wouldn't dare to say, God is my witness. Show it. The reality is we are peripheral in our hearts, in our thoughts, and that's it. This is why significant prayers are not made. And if significant prayers are not made, how would Bethel benefit from our prayer? Seriously, how would Bethel benefit from our prayer? You see, prayer, if it is truly a pillar, then it must be there. Right? But if that pillar is wobbly, what's the use of that pillar? What is the pillar holding up? Nothing. It's just ornamental. Ornamental pillars are not much to consider. You think about what it really, really means. And now, here we come to the whole idea of what a significant prayer really is. Right? So let's, let's learn how to make that significant prayer. Okay? A very important one. <clears throat> Verse 6. What was the commencing work of Bethel? What is its completion? So, Philippians 1.6, Paul says, now this is an important prayer to make. Paul says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, it's very important. It's, it's like bringing up a child. Right? So here is a child you say you love, you take care of, you look after, you do all these things here. It's good to commence. Several years down the road, it's not the same. And then it gets more and more costly. And after a while, you begin to realize it is very hard. To start is easy to pray for a commencement and a completion of the work is the challenging part. What we, we talk about here, holding literally fast the word of life, right? Now, the challenge is for Bethel to do that. We began this work as the work of faith. Holding fast the word of life Believing that this is what we are called to do as a church and then staying the course. This must be what we look at. Right? Now, this is absolutely important for us to understand and to appreciate. Right? So, this is where we must begin here. Lord, you have commenced battle with this desire. We are going to have this building. We are making a statement. This morning, I purposely drove through Main Street. Instead of coming straight, I turned to Main Street first. And look at a place there, same old, same old. The grass is very long. They don't cut the thing here. The place is there. That's it. They don't know how to take care of it. Right? First, we paid for, we paid for the place there. 
then, okay, we're going to buy this place. We sell the place, take the money, buy, buy the land here. That's half a million dollars then. Right? So we put our money where our mouth is. We started. Okay, next, the next part of it. The two and a half million dollars in. No, that's three million already. Put it there. And then we commence this new building here at Milford. Now, the question is, where is it going? Right? Now, this is important. Where is it going? Though I still remember when we, we had to tell people to sit in the centre uh, because, you know, the church is too big. Yeah. Right? We still, uh, this place is still too big. Can we fill the church? That's the challenge. Now remember, we started in India, we started this Sunday, one little church there, less than 20 people. It's 29 years later, there are 300 people. Visubhasam, 300 people today. Bethany, we started 25 people. 27th August, we were at Shangri-La, 1,000 people. Would you dare to make this your prayer? Make Bethel significant. Lord, complete this work. Now, the complete work is not yet done. In other words, it, please keep continuing this work until it is completed. Is it completed yet? No. There is much work to be done. But it begins with our heart. If we don't have that love for it, believe me, very little will be done. We all have our own ideas. Why do we do this? Why do we do that? Look, let's not talk ideas. Anybody can come up with any idea. Show me where your heart is. Tell me about your prayer life. Tell me what God is doing. What God has begun in your heart, would you let it be complete? Many are the lives which are incomplete works of God. We start well, we backslide, we tail off, it's gone. Very few actually have seen God's completing of that work in their lives. Many promising people, and then they have their own thoughts and ideas, and God's work is incomplete. This is a prayer we begin with. Lord, complete your work. Right? We tell ourselves, we our children, love the Lord, may they grow in their faith, um, you know, and so on and so forth. But it's an incomplete work. Would you pray this prayer, Lord, complete that work. Right? Now, this is important for us. It's the first part of it, number two. Right? Now, watch this very carefully because this is where the prayer is. Okay. It was nine now. This, I pray, your love may abound still more and more. Now that's that's why I, that's why I ask you to begin with is is really a love for battle there. Don't talk to me, but show me. What's love? I mean, seriously, what is that love? Does it abound? Right. So. Um, my little uh, sugar, there it is. It starts with a little, little bit of love, not much. Right? Then um, I look after it. Then that love abounds more and more and more and more all the time. If that love is there, it's, it, it must abound. It's the same. So if I want to say I love the Lord, I love the church, then I ask, ask myself, does that love really abound? 
First, is there? Question, is it abounding? Question, is it abounding more and more? Not the same. So I can say, I love Bethel. Great! But is it abounding? Is it abounding more and more? That is a significant prayer. Because it's not always there. You know, a love for the Lord's work, a love for the church, actually is a very rare thing. I mean, let's face it. If we are honest with ourselves, and God is our witness here for you, do you really love the church? And I want to challenge that seriously within our heart. Is it really there? All right, think about this. But how do you measure love anyway? We say we want to love this. Okay, how? How do you measure it? How do you measure that love? And Paul offers two thoughts. One, knowledge is part of that love. Two, discernment is part of that love. Right? So we keep on asking, what do we do next? Now, that's important. So when we started in Bethany many years ago, 50 years ago, Sunday school. Right? We began with the evening worship, actually, because in the morning I was uh, you know, uh, serving at another church. So it was sort of, okay, let's, let's do that first. So the evening service, the challenge was to, to build it up. So then the morning service began after, a few years later, because the evening was just too full. Okay, we split. Now we got two services, two different congregations. And then we ask ourselves, what else, we, what else can we do? Knowledge, evangelism classes, discipleship classes. I, did, I would do five, six classes a week. Different groups. Question, knowledge, discernment. Because if that love is without knowledge, without discernment, it's not love. I see a lot of people have not grown further. How much more knowledge of God have you, have you, have you got one year later? Mm-hmm. And you'll see many people about the same. Mm-hmm. About the same all the time. This is why I keep pushing uh, Pastor Chris. Okay, now, read on your own. Mm-hmm. Okay. Old Testament uh, prophets. Mm-hmm. Okay, read. You don't stop. Mm-hmm. What else? What else? What else? Knowledge, discernment. If we are not growing in that knowledge and that discernment, we're not growing. That's it. Because love and knowledge and discernment are related. That's what it is. You know, we really ask ourselves, what is that knowledge? What is that discernment? And if we are not growing in anything, if we are not discerning, we will lose out. See, a lot of people in Singapore, because of the pandemic, I cannot, people don't want to touch your money, uh, people you know, are afraid of it all. The only way to go, digital. And then suddenly, in three years, 70% of businesses went digital. Checks went out of fashion, right? So from September onwards, all checks are now, they're going to charge $6 for one check written. And they're going to face it out. They're going to make it even worse and harder and harder. Digital, there was now no choice. You either go digital, even Hawker Centre. The older people, we don't have... You either do it or you lose business. So everybody had to learn. Sharp learning curve. No choice. Everything was going digital. Travel digital. Everywhere you go, you have to have some kind of thing to say that you have been vaccinated digital. 
There was no choice. Knowledge, discernment. That's how we survive. Right? This applies also to church and our spiritual life. A lot of people are just, okay, I don't need to know much. I'm happy to tell you that we're going to the second reprint of the memory verse cards. The memory verse cards that were given out in Bethany, people don't know how much it costs. It costs a lot of money to get it properly embossed, properly hot stamped and everything. 500 packs cost over $7,000 to print the memory cards. All went out. People asked for more. And then someone said, uh, Pastor, we don't have enough. Let's say it's going to cost another $7,000. The person said, fine, let me offer it. Print it. Give 100 to Bethel. It's part of the thing. We go into reprint. Doesn't matter how much it costs. Knowledge, discernment. Why do we want to do this? We take it one step further. We read, now we memorize. Knowledge, discernment. The problem is that we are not growing in knowledge and discernment. How to make significant prayers. I don't even know what to ask for. How do I discern what the needs are? If I don't have knowledge and discernment, how do I pray significant prayers? I can't. So I go back into, right? This is how it works, general prayers. It's by default. We make general prayers, but they are not significant. Will God continue to answer those prayers? Yes. But the church would never be significant. The challenge is what makes it significant. Right? Then we go on further to verse 10. That you may approve the things that are excellent. So we ask ourselves, what are the things which are excellent? Right? It has to do with knowledge, discernment, and then you can say, you know, this is a good program. We are going to attempt this. Prove things that are excellent. Right? So that was our prayer for Bethany as we entered into the 51st year. Right? Well, let's ask ourselves, what will the Lord do? And the giving of the people confirmed what we are going to do. And that is going to be important. So on a, on a single month, our offering came to nearly 2 million. Why? Because we want to approve things that are excellent. What do we want to do? Right? Beyond cornfield, beyond church building, beyond all of these things that we are already doing. What things are excellent? We want to train servants of God so that they will become disciples of the Lord. This is so badly missing today. Right? Now, this is important. So, we are going to have plans where the pastors can travel uh, over to our country to have conferences, to have retreats, and so on and so forth. That costs a lot of money. But will we do it? Yes. Because we know the things that are excellent. Where they are, they will never be able to go beyond a certain level. And our challenge is to provide the next level upwards. These are important, these are significant prayers that Bethel must ask itself, what is significant, right? So how do we know that's what it is? Okay, now this is important. You see, there are very clear results. Right, one, this is very important, verse 10, that you may be sincere without offence. So are we going to be really sincere about what we're going to do? Are we going to say words? Right? 
Now, if we are just going to say words, the words mean nothing. We've already been saying so many words. Show me sincerity. Don't, don't just words. Don't we use yours sincerely. That means nothing. Yours faithfully. Words, it also means nothing. Nowadays, people say regards, whatever that means. Some people don't even say anything. Just put your name there. Some people don't even put a name there. There's nothing. Yeah, that's, that's how it works. Approve the things that are excellent, sincere. All right? So from time to time, people try to hack into my laptop and all that. So this morning, they said, oh, we have Microsoft, from Microsoft, I use a Microsoft, I don't use Apple. And they say, we have noted that have been unusual use of your laptop in Myanmar. See? That's nonsense. How sincere? Not sincere. Obviously, scams. Scam people will appear sincere, they are not. Right? I mean, we are looking at this kind of... Are people really, really sincere? Right? Just last week in Indonesia, they arrested over 80 people, love scams. Because these guys know what to say, how to say it, and they rip off by the millions every year. Right? In Singapore, the danger is that they are ripping off by the billions and they get arrested. Are they really sincere? No. Just words. Words are not necessarily sincere. Right? How do you see sincerity? What? Significant prayers. If you really are sincere, make a significant prayer for Bethel. Check your heart. Do you really love Bethel? Two, what are you willing to show that you really are sincere? Show me. Don't tell me. Show me. This morning, if I were to ask you, will you make a commitment? This is what I want to do for Bethel. I will pray for Bethel. I will support Bethel. I will give to Bethel and fo follow it all the way through for a whole year. That is sincerity. Anything else is not sincerity. This is what we, that you may be sincere without offense. Right? We started. And we are looking at it. You know, we had, a, we had began a new orphanage work. So, it, two years, we built six buildings. Right? Housing is not stopping. We're going to carry on because we only wanted to do the first part of it. I want to see how the kids are doing, how the staff is doing. Next year, we expand the work. We'll be expanding the work to a few more buildings. Why? Sincere. Now, it's very important for us to ask ourselves without offence. So, one, one pastor wrote to me and he said, Pastor, um, can you help us? We also have an orphanage work. So, I asked, what are your plans? We have no plans. Sorry, forget it. Oh, we got so many children, we can't feed them. Then why start a work that you can't finish? See, that's how it happens. So kids don't have shelter, they don't have food, they ask for funds, and they call it faith. That's not faith, that's nonsense. So I tell them, this is not a work that I'm going to support. Look at what we are saying. We say it, we plan it, we do it, we complete it. Okay, now that we've done one whole year, we are now ready to expand further. That's what it takes. Come on, in any kind of business, you cannot say, let's just do it. It won't work. You've got to think, okay, where's money coming from? This is what we're going to put in. What are the returns? 
How are we going to go about it? How are we going to plan it? No business will succeed if it is not carefully thought of and planned for. What makes you think the church will just, just anyhow we can do it? It doesn't work like that. Significant prayers, significant plans and commitment without offence. Right? So we promise and then we don't fulfil it. Right? So there was one person who in a church building program that I know and so he said, oh, I'm going to give 50 lorry loads of sand. He wrote down. I said, uh, you sure you are going to give 50 loads of, of, of sand? He said, yes. Do you know how much one lorry load costs? You can give 50. You sure? He didn't fulfill it. That's, ha that's what happens. It's not our church. It's another church that I was helping to look out. It doesn't work. It's not words. It's we end up with offence. We say something, we don't, feel it, we don't fulfil it. What's the use of all that? The challenge is to do it in such a way that we do it with honour, with dignity, we fulfil it. That's the way it works. It's going to be without offence, and that is important. Okay? And then finally, and this is going to be important, verse 11. Right? Now, the construction of the sentence is not as clear. It says, being filled. Literally, it is the idea of all of the above are done. The results would be this. Right? So when we talk about true righteousness, true righteousness is not just simply imputed righteousness. It's for real. Are we truly sincere without offence and righteous? If that is the case, then the results are very obvious. That's very important. Right? In anything, that is something that we want to, to look at. Right? Where are the fruits of righteousness? Right? So if we are looking at, looking at these things here and if there are no fruits to speak about, they're just words. The reality of it all, ultimately, in anything, is what we call fruits. If there are no fruits to speak of, there's nothing to speak of. The reality of it all is what we call P&L. Out there, the business world is profit and loss. What are your profits? What are your losses? It's there. This we call it, in our language, Bible language, we call it fruits of righteousness. Right? So Daniel and his friends determined when they went to Babylon as refugees, and they said, we're going to do this. All right? So what is going to do? Well, this is what it, how it works. They became top of the class. Right? The Lord blessed because of their faith and their determination to be righteous. And so they went right to the top of everything they did. This is fruit of righteousness. And this is something that we must ourselves, ask ourselves. What are the real fruits? Right? Many people confuse words with works. Anybody can say, I feel for you, Pastor, I'm praying for you, uh, yeah, I, so, you know, I'll be there, is there anything I can do? They always say that. I, when people say there anything, I, it comes to nothing. Don't say, do it. That's the best thing. Many, many people say, yeah, I want to do it, yeah. You know, I feel that I want to do it. If there's anything else left in me to do, I will do it. Really? <laughs> Serious? Okay, I've got another uh, $3 million project next year. You want to give me the check for $3 million? 
No, it's not coming. And you know it. And you, we all know that's how it works. Right? So we have to literally ask ourselves, as we end every year, we ask ourselves, are we barely making it or are we going to surplus? That is filled with the fruits of righteousness. Filled. Right? It's not half empty, half full. No point talking half empty, half full. This is filled with righteousness. Don't talk about half full. Let's talk about full and beyond. That's it. Right? So let's not talk about budget. No point. Seriously. Because we're not conscious of it. We have no source of income. We have only this thing that we can begin with. This is Paul's prayer. At the Philippine church, Paul tells them, but my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 And Paul wrote to them, well, no churches supported me, you did. That's how it works. Right? Now, I'm saying these things here because, one, I'm not a beneficiary of Bethel in any way. All these years, I have never taken a dollar from Bethel. I say, never. And don't plan to start. Don't want to. Right? That is where the sincerity comes in. If I'm making a pitch because I'm going to receive something from it, then I am insincere. Because bottom line, it's benefiting me, not going that way. So right at the beginning, this was a policy that I made for myself. From no church that I visit will I ever seek a dollar from anyone. Then I've been doing this for 50 years. Then how does it work? Prayer. Significantly. Right? Now this is very important. So I made a promise to Pastor Chris that when he comes over, I will be here to be with him, support all the way. So I looked this year and I said between September, then next year, February, what? Too many months. So I told him from here onward, December, I will also come. That December is a horribly busy month. But I will still come over here. And so from here onwards, I will try to say, okay, we're going to try to do, do it. You see, you say you do it. Please remember, I'm no longer a spring chicken. <laughs> right? One of, our, one of your church members here, the sister just passed away. And she is my age. The last couple of years, she's terribly sick and then finally expired. And I am very conscious of the fact that that can happen. In a week, one of our you know, church members doesn't come to our church, doesn't go to church at all, just passed away, 50 years old. Can that happen? Yes. What's my commitment? Well, I am very deeply committed. I'm going to do my part, stay healthy. Physically, spiritually. That is the challenge. Right? So Paul here writes to Timothy, bodily exercises uh, profits little. Well, up to a point, I will be there. Right? But I'm not going to go to the gym and spend several hours to build up big muscles, wear shirts that are less than the actual size so that the muscles will bulge a little bit more. That profits very little. But spiritual exercises, that is what we are going to have. That is going to profit a great deal. So that's going to be the message in October. Right? So Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, this is what you want to do. That's the second week of October message. Right, Timothy, this is what you must do. You must give diligence. Take heed to yourself. So my challenge to all of us is to take heed to ourselves. 
will you offer a significant prayer for Bethel? But how? Again, we go back. You need to begin with a real heart of love for Bethel. And it's important. Right? So you have, uh, Pastor Chris has two sets of, of, of uh, parents here. Parents-in-law and uh, you know, parents. Of course, they want him to be there. And so this is their heart for him. That's understandable. That's love. That's family. Right? But if we're not related, that's a different story. Right? The question is, what does it mean? What does Bethel really mean? There is where significant prayer comes in. There must be love. There must be knowledge. There must be discernment. There must be this fruit that we are talking about. Then can we say, this is significant praying. Anything else is just general words of prayer and they don't come to much. Right? So we let the years pass by. Right? So the question is, how significant have we become spiritually? For many people, nothing much. It's just another year. Right? This is something that we all must ask ourselves. Do we want to become significant in anything that we do? We must know what is needed to become significant. What is needed? And I must ask myself, am I willing to pay the price? And if I'm not willing to pay the price, I don't understand the cost of it all, I will end up offense, not going to work. That is my challenge as we commence the 30th year of ministry for Bethel. We begin by learning to pray significant prayers. And may God help us and say, help us to fulfill it. Right? Isaiah 41.10 tells us not to be afraid, not to be dismayed, not to be fearful, because the Lord says, I, I am with you. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Do I really even believe that? And the answer is yes. You know what? I'm going to do it. I am going to do it. And I mean it with all my heart. Can this be done? It's up to any, all of us individually. No other way. Think about this. Okay, well, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the challenge to really understand all that you have planned for us. The blessings which are there in the heavenly places, we know they're there, but very often they are not realized. We pray that you will help us to dare to pray significant prayers. And then to ask that you will help us to see them fulfilled. Lord, be witness to our heart that we love you, that we love your church, and we are willing to do anything to pray that his love will abound more and more in knowledge, in discernment, in being able to approve the things that are excellent, to be filled with the fruits of righteousness as well. We give thanks that we can offer such prayers to you. We thank you that you will hear and you will answer according to the faith that we have in our hearts. We ask you to bless in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, let's prepare for worship. Thank you.